Hi, welcome to Board Gems. This is my regular video series, episodes on the 3rd, 13th, and 23rd of the month. And in these episodes, I go over older board game gems. Uh, this episode is pretty old. This is a game I had, I don't think I'd ever heard of until it was suggested for the channel. And that is a game called Shrilla Stilla. Right here. So this was designed by Peter Wischmann, and he's a longtime designer. He's obviously done this one, uh, which originally came out in 1999, but he has recent designs too. Uh, in the English-speaking kind of board game hobby world, he might be most famous for number nine, which is almost as different from this game as you can get, I feel. It's for three to six players. For the rules as written, you probably want four to six. I think with three, you'd probably need a variant to make it interesting. Uh, the box says 10 and up. Game's really simple. I think an eight and up could definitely play it. And the box says 90 minutes. In my experience, that's a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, my games have typically gone uh, about an hour, I would say. Despite the fact that this plays three to six players, the length of time it takes isn't drastically different um, between three players and six players because a lot of the play is simultaneous. This is about uh, having a record label, I suppose, and you have all these crazy weird bands that are going through the top 14, and at the end of every round you evaluate whose bands are where in the placement, whether they went up or down, and you get points as a result. And it has a really unique physical mechanism, which you'll see in the how to play part. Why don't you watch the how to play part? That's coming up right now. Afterwards, I'll talk to you about whether this is still a gem or not. To set up the game, place the board on the table between the players. The board shows a score track going from zero all the way up to 75, and it has 14 places for bands. This is sort of the, the top 14 bands. And the bands are in this pile. You're going to shuffle up these tiles. And let's look at the first one. So every band shows a name, in this case the High Heel Snakers. I don't know if these are funny puns in German or not. There's a lot of German names as well, but some are in English. And there's one or two colors on the bottom. The only thing that matters from a game mechanism point of view is the bar at the bottom, which shows one or two colors. So these colors correspond with these labels. There's, in this case, yellow and orange. If the band does well and scores points, it scores points for the label, so anybody who has these colors will benefit. But these can actually change over the course of the game. Players choose their colors, but not at the start. Instead, what happens is we flip over these tiles, one at a time, relatively slowly. And at any point, a player can jump in and call out a color that has not yet been claimed. We start adding the bands from place 14 all the way up to place 1. We start adding these bands, and at any point, somebody can call out a color. Somebody might say blue, okay? So they get the blue label. So that's this one. They get this CD sleeve, I suppose is what you'd call it. One of these, as well as three markers in the label's color. The cube is the score marker, so that'll start on zero. I'll explain these in a second. They're identical except one has a dot on them, so I'll get two of those. And now that player's out for now, but the other players can continue and call out other colors. Orange, all right. Of course, you don't know which one's gonna be number one. Green, all right. We'll do a four player game. And the last player, they can just wait until it all fills up and then decide on the remaining color, purple, okay. So these will be the four colors currently in play. So each player puts their score markers on zero. The rules are in German, so the terminology might be a little different based on what translation you're using. I call these hunch markers, 
These are markers that you're going to be assigning secretly to the bands. And you may gain or lose points based on what happens to those bands. This one with the dot is the new number one. You will put, you will bet this hunch marker on a band that you think might be the, num the number one band by the end of the round. If you're right, you'll score points. If you're wrong, nothing happens. And this one, this hunch marker, is just a band that you think will do well. For every place that the band goes up, you will gain a point, and for every place that the band drops, you will lose a point. But the rest of the bands, sort of near space 14, besides their position on the board, there are also these markers, and you're gonna place these markers on the bands. The reason we have these is because the bands will move around and you'll be able to see how its position improved or got worse. So if this band later on becomes here, you'll know it went up three places. Now the game takes place over a number of rounds. During a round, play is simultaneous. Players are going to be secretly assigning wooden tokens to bet on particular bands, but also influence their movement. And all of these get submitted secretly into this machine, <laughs> which we can call the CD player. So you got the base here, and you got this thing, which has two holes in it. And you have these two pegs, put the long one in the middle, which it will turn around, and this one for the handle. You can see you can move it around. And this is just the cover that goes on top. You'll see how it works. The last thing I have not mentioned is this bag. In this bag, there are a number of wooden tokens, the same size as these ones, but they all have various numbers on them, ranging from one to, I think four is the largest that I've seen. And the numbers are either red or black, red being negative and black being positive. At the start of every round, you put these in the bag and mix them up, pass the bag around, each player draws seven, and then passes the bag. Then they take their CD sleeve, and inside they put their CD, I suppose. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm using the right terminology. And in this sort of little sleeve here, you're going to be assigning the tokens. So you're going to look at your seven tokens, and remember you will also have these tokens, which count as plus one, but they also have another effect. You're going to choose five of these tokens, and of course these two, and assign them each to one of the 14 bands. Each space can only have one marker. So if you put this marker, this is green, if I put this in the four, I'm saying I want band four to move ahead three spaces. And of course, other players may influence as well. So you'll do this for all of them. But you only use five of these tokens. The other two, you're just going to set aside face down. People can't see them. And you will also assign these. This is the one that you think will improve the most. You'll gain one point at the end of the round for every place this goes up, but you'll lose a point if it goes down. You lose one point for every place it goes down. And also, which one do you think is the new number one? It has to be a new number one, so there's no point in betting on the one currently in number one, but maybe number two will reach there, so we'll do that. And then you close it up. To keep the tokens in place. So all players are doing this at the same time. What happens then, after everyone's ready, is you get this thing, <laughs> the CD player. You take the sleeve, put it on top of the CD player, putting these two holes on these two pegs, like so. You can put this cover on top and then take this tab and pull the sleeve out. 
all the tokens that you had placed in there have now dropped into this gray disc. And all players do so. I'm going to simulate a four-player game, so I'm going to just go ahead and play for the other players so you'll see how it works. What I like to do is put all the CDs on the tray at once. I think you can fit five. The sixth is a little bit of a tight fit. Put that on top and then pull out all the CD sleeves one at a time, starting from the bottom. And of course you can then pass the CD sleeves back to the uh, player who uh, owns that label. Okay, and now we're ready to begin. Then we reveal, starting with band 14, we rotate the CD such that the 14 is lined up with the opening here, and we see what falls out. So band 14, minus 1, plus 4, so the total is plus 3, this band will go up 3 places. And you slide all the other ones down. Keep going to 13. Ooh, 13 goes up 4 spaces. Now remember, you're actually moving the band with the marker 13, not the band currently in 13, because these will move around. But this, these, this marker was placed for the band who at the time was in place 13, which is this one. This is going to go up four spaces from 14 to 10. 12 is also going up. Where's 12 here? So that's also going up four. One, two, three, four. <laughs> these bands are all kind of jockeying. Band 11, just one space up. 10 drops by four places. One, two, and if it ever goes past space 14, it's out. It has dropped off the charts. Uh, the translation I read refers to this as being relegated, <laughs> as if this is some Premier League team. Hey, it's, it's the titular band, Shrillastilla. When a band drops off the ranks, we just put it to the side for now, but these labels, the players who own these labels, are going to lose points at the end of the round for every band that has dropped off the charts. But there's never gaps, so these ones will then move up. Nothing for band 9, nothing for 8, 7. 7 goes up by 3 and also has this marker on it. One, two, three. This means that green is betting that this band will do well, and so far, that's a good bet. Oh, lots of activity on band six. Actually, I made a mistake. These markers also count as plus one, so this band should have gone up four places, not three. So if we have a look here, let's total them up. These cancel out, and this one counts as a one. This is for band six, so six goes up one place. Band five. Minus four. <laughs> one, two, three, four. Band four. Oh, lots of activity here. Three, four, five, six. Band 4 will go up 6 places, and it tops out at 1. It doesn't go past 1. But these markers will go on top, like so. Band 3, a lot of activity. And it's moving down. These cancel out. Negative 5. Band 3 moves down 5 places, from 5 to 10. Band 2, a lot of people seem to think band 2 is going to be the new number 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, yeah. 
And finally, the former number one, Ginny Corn. Negative two. Now, we score points. The first thing you check is the top six. You'll see these pips underneath. This is how many points that the labels get for their bands that are in the top six. And for each band that has more than one color, each of those colors will score the points. So starting in first place, this band, Elk Test what? Elk Test Practicants. Purple and orange will get six points. The second place band will gain five for green and purple. Blue and orange get four. Green and orange get three. Blue and orange get two. And red and orange each get one. There is no red in play. Now we check if there is a new number one. And there is. This band that was previously number two is now number one. For every one of these markers with a dot on it, that's a new number one hunch. Each of those bands scores five points. So everybody's scoring five points except purple. Players can get these markers back, including purple. Purple doesn't lose any points. Now we look at the rising bands. We look at these hunches. We look at all the bands that have these blank markers on them. And we see how many places they rose or fell. In this case, this band was previously fourth and now is second. Blue and orange each get two points. This band was seventh and now is third. Green gets four points. And this was sixth and is now fourth. Purple gets two points. And again, those players can get these markers back. Any of the bands that are in these last four places, the ones with the exclamation marks, any of these bands that are falling, not rising, are going to drop off the charts. So this band, for example, was 14th, but is now 13th. It's actually improved, so it will stay on the charts. But this was 11th and is now 12th. It's dropped off. And this was 5th, down to 11th. This is a big drop, so this one's also gone. And again, this will go up to fill the gap. Now, each band that has been relegated will cost its labels two points. So in this case, orange loses two points for Shrillastilla, green doesn't lose any, blue loses two, and purple loses two. And these will go away. You might have noticed that the score track has a different colored mark at 30, 50, and 70. That's because something special happens if one of the score markers breaks that, that barrier. If a marker has passed 30 for the first time, then the top three bands retire. They are removed from the board. The labels do not lose any points for these, and all the other bands move up. That just happens one time when a marker, any marker, passes 30 for the first time. It happens again when a marker passes 50. And 70? Well, 70 triggers the end of the game. Now, if you're not playing a six-player game, you'll know that there are some labels which are not in use. At this point, before we add new bands, players have an opportunity to change labels. Now, it's not actually clear from my working translation how this happens. I did notice that one translation that I was reading uh, actually says something which is not in the original rules, so I don't want to teach that. I will assume that this is treated the same way as in the first part of the game. At one point, at some time, the player calls out, go. And then any player can call out a color that is not currently in play. So if somebody is not happy with their position, they may call out yellow. And then the first person to call that out gets it. And they would replace their score marker and their hunch markers with the appropriate color. But you keep going. That player will give up their color and now that may be available for another player to claim. So you just do that, it's just first come first served 
until everybody's happy with the labels. Of course, you can only claim labels that are available. You can't take a label that's owned by another player. So after everybody's happy with their labels, now we add new bands. And again, we start with 14. And then finally, we reposition the place markers. And that's another round. Each player gets their CD back. All these tokens that were set aside get placed back into the bag and mixed up. And then players will draw another seven from which they choose five and place it somewhere on their CD to influence these bands. You're gonna keep going like that. Again, if, as soon as any marker reaches 70, the end of the game is triggered. And at that point, the player with the most points wins. That's it. You're ready to play Shrilla Stilla. You might watch the How to Play part and you might think there is no strategy. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, you're mostly right. So, <laughs> okay, there's got to be a little bit because when you have three players versus six players, and six players is just crazy chaos, right? And with three players, you do have more control. But is it strategy? You probably wouldn't call it strategy. You know, you have a, a bunch of tokens, and some of them you want to go up, and some of them you want to go down. You do have some choices to which ones to keep. You only discard two of them. And of the ones that you have, you decide which ones go up and which go down. Well, you want yours to go up. You want your opponents to go down. The only real decisions are which ones and where, because each band can only uh, have one of your tokens on it. And maybe you want to make a bet on the new number one, which is you, the band you think will be the new number one is not your band. You would normally want that to go down, but maybe that one you want to put a bet on, which will actually help it. Yeah, there are decisions. You're not going to hurt your brain over this game, though. This You have to approach this game like a, just a wild ride, okay? You're going to put in, you're going to enter in, you're going to program in the changes you want to make to the bands, and they get fed into this bizarre contraption, and then this contraption just spits it out later, and you all see the results. It's, it's a crazy ride, what can I say? But I, I will say for sure, it is a lot of fun. Sometimes we as hobbyists get really hung up on the idea of, oh, you want a strategic game, angsty decisions, right? It's like, oh, I should do this and not do that. And, and you know, maybe I'll do this and it won't work out. And some people equate that with strategy, but there's lots of different games that serve lots of different purposes and push different buttons use different parts of your brain or use no parts of your brain, but are fun in other ways. In the case of Shrilla Stilla, the fun is in the reveal and the crazy contraption. So you plug all your things in into the contraption and then it spits it out one by one. And every time you turn the wheel, a bunch of tokens fall out and it is a really fun reveal to see what comes out. It's like, oh, right? And, I mean, in some ways, if you want to be critical, you could say it's a little bit more of an activity than a game, right? Just put punching numbers into your little thing and then everybody feeds in their things and then in the end, see what happens. Um, not a game in the strategic sense. It's, it's in a weird slot, like a weird genre, which is almost like it can be for everyone, right? This can this game can be played and enjoyed by gamers and non-gamers alike. For gamers, especially gamers who are used to more strategic games, this is basically a gamer's party game. This is a game that you you maybe at the end of the night you you finished your your big you know main course of a game, your two hour game, and your your brain is all fried. And what do you want to do? You want to play something fun, but you still want to play like a game, right? Not everybody likes pure party games. There is a genre of games that play like hobby games, like games that we would understand as, as hobby games, but are super light and don't even have like really any strategy. And Shrilla still falls into that category. Totally casual game for non-gamers, 
and for gamers it's a super super light fun and funny party like game it does play a large number of people six people one advantage of six is that there is no changing of the label so one of the weird things about this game is that players player colors are potentially temporary and i've played games in which people mostly just kept their whole colors the whole game in a, a large player count that's good most people are going to probably keep their their colors for most of the game and it's just a couple people will change here and there but yeah player colors can change your well, you want to change labels that's a little weird and in a six player game that never happens there are no spare labels to switch to so everybody has a label to start with and that's their label for the whole game uh, four or five you do have that kind of slightly weird element in which you can change labels i want to talk a little bit about older board games from germany that have never had english language versions and my experience with them so ever since starting this video series especially it happened before but especially since i would kind of evaluate some of these older games now i don't speak german or read german so what do i do probably what you would do is you'll go on the internet doesn't necessarily have to be board game geek although that is kind of the main repository in english but there are other resources too or there used to be in which you could find translations fan translations of these games here's the thing about the fan translations they're often deliberately wrong <laughs> and you wouldn't think so when what i'm expecting from a translation is a translation it's like this is what it is in german and this is what it would be those exact same rules in english and what a lot of the fan translators do now keep in mind the hobby in english was much much smaller back then people would import this maybe they had a german friend or a german speaking friend who helped them translate it and then they would play the game and it wasn't quite to their liking and maybe that they didn't know if that was a mistranslation or if just you know the game as published wasn't quite what they were looking for so they would change it i talked about this in a previous video it was very common in older games for players to just tweak it do some variants to make the game work better for them and this was early early days of the internet there wasn't an expectation we would do like this official translation so they were translating it for themselves to have fun with their family and friends and what you'll see is rules modifications creeping into translations for older games you find an older game you download the translation don't trust it as it is the game itself would probably work great with that translation somebody translated it and played it maybe they made tweaks you don't know maybe those tweaks made the game better you don't know but you can't trust that th those old translations are exactly what the designer and or publisher intended so anyway long story short i end up doing a lot of translations myself uh, i don't speak german or read german but uh, Google Translate is very, very good now. Uh, you know, they use their, their AI and stuff, and you're not translating Dostoevsky, okay? Th these are rules. I w don't get creative with them, right? I, want, I just want to know how it plays. And so I do end up taking, sometimes retyping the German uh, text into a document, into Google Docs, and then translating the document. And obviously I have to change it and tweak it. And I'm hoping I'm not introducing any changes. It works for me. And I just have more confidence in that than some of the fan translations that were made a long time ago and uploaded to the internet a long time ago. A lot of times they maybe even unknowingly add changes. I translated this game myself, which was, you know, it took some time, but I did it. And I'm pretty confident in how I taught the game. But there is one part of the rules that wasn't very clear, and that is uh, that you're able to change labels. 
in the beginning of the game, when you choose your label, it's real time. Right? You just call out the color when you want it. You want blue? Just call out blue and hope you call out blue before somebody else does. During the game, you have the opportunities to change labels. But the rule book, as I translated it, wasn't very clear as to how that works. And I did read one fan translation for this that suggested that you do it from last place to first place. That's reasonable, not in the rules that I can see. But the rules don't really say very clearly. So uh, what I end up doing is just doing real time, just like the beginning of the game. Seems to make sense. And that's a little weird because, like, let's say you're playing a five-player game, and so everybody's got a label already, and there's one label free. So basically you have to, like, start, you know, drop your hand or maybe use a gavel or something, and as soon as you hit it, a person can, op can have the opportunity to then call out. Right. And then if it's a tie, what happens? Okay, that one person does do it. They change labels. Now, is that label available for other people to pick? Again, the rules don't really say. So that part I'm not super confident about, but the way I taught it is a way that works and works for us. The real time part at the beginning is completely fine. I have no problem with it because you're starting from place 14 and you're going up and it's a little bit of a push your luck, right? You don't know the best bands, what label they're going to be for. So do you call out early and hope you get lucky or do you hang on until the end? I like that, but the real time part's a little weird mid game. I've played a three player. I like the game, so I'm fine three player and it's pretty breezy with three players, but it's not gonna be for everyone um, because there's a lot of bands that nobody cares about. It still works. But it's a little less satisfying. You probably want to play with at least four. Having said that, because six players is in some ways the way to play, I think it might actually be a cool variant to play a three-player game like a six-player game, in which each player has two labels. Now, I'm not a game designer. I'm not even a variant designer. So I don't feel comfortable coming up with rules in terms of, like, would you get, like, more tokens? Or do you have like the two discs in you? Like, I don't know, right? But I think probably if you wanted to play this three player, uh, you got, got some work cut out for you to probably try a variant where you play it more like a six player game. But I would definitely consider this a big group game. This contraption is bizarre. <laughs> and it is, I mean, it's nice when a game has a centerpiece. Like this is just a cool thing and it's entirely wooden. There's no other components to this. Right? Except the cardboard you put on. But it's neat. And you know what? I was trying to think of what's another way to, to do that mechanism. And I was thinking like, well, I suppose you could do like 14 separate cloth bags that you put your tokens in. But even that's not completely practical because which bags are you putting in? Do you put something in everything just so people don't know which bags you're putting in? So this does work. And I can't immediately think of a different or better way to do exactly what this game wants this to do. So pretty crazy and it's solid wood. My goodness. What a what a what a contraption. The band names and illustrations are ridiculous and not in a good way. Uh, the names like some are obvious puns on real bands. For exa for example, there's a Rambach instead of what I assume to be Rammstein. There's a pun version of Bjork, for example. Um, but most of them I don't recognize. Elk Test Practicants. But each band also has an illustration, and the illustrations are just bizarre. They're things that I can't get behind. I ask myself, right, well, like, there's modern art, right? Um, I love modern art, and the first version of modern art the first the early versions had had art on them which was terrible but that was the point right you're supposed to kind of be art speculators you're guessing on which of these like all of this art is terrible but some of it's going to become valuable and you're trying to figure out which ones this game came out after modern art i feel like they were trying to do kind of the same thing look at all these crazy weird bizarre bands you know, but some of these are going to, to be number one, which ones? First of all, it's almost 25 years later. 
And secondly, it's from a, a different culture. So I, I don't feel comfortable judging it. For right now, in the English-speaking world, the, the names and the, the band illustrations absolutely do not work. It's a unique game. There's no other game like it in my collection. So if you want a variety of games, sure, you can look at this. Personally, I wouldn't suggest going out of your way to find this game. If you know somebody that's kind of local who is collecting old German games and they want to get rid of it, you can look at it. Or if you see it on an auction online and you can pick it up at a reasonable price, yeah, I mean, if what I've said sounds interesting, give it a try. I would love to see a new version of this, and Spielworks is, has apparently announced a new version of this game uh, that will be on Kickstarter maybe later 2021 or perhaps 2022. Definitely, if you're interested in the game, keep an eye out for the Kickstarter. Don't, don't go out of your way to get a copy of this particular one unless some of the band names and illustrations actually attract you, at which point go for it. But otherwise, definitely wait until the Kickstarter comes out and see what Spielworks does with it. I always have said that games can be for everyone, and there are people for whom Shrilla Stilla would be a great game. It's it's not that long. The box says 90 minutes. My experience is no. It's not a quick game, but I don't think my games... I think my games... The longest game I've played was probably 90 minutes with rules explanation. But it breezed right by, like, you know... And you can even decide to play a shorter game if you want to. You know, you there's a change at 30, a change at 50, and the game ends at 70. You could end the game at 50. And I've offered that to people to say, like, why don't we, you know, reach 50 and then see how people feel. And people reach 50 and they go, well, let's keep going. Let's go to 70, right? <laughs> people do have fun. But what is fun? Fun is not just in the strategy. Fun can come from a lot of different things. It can come from the art. It can come from the components. It can come from a crazy, wacky gizmo. <laughs> wooden gizmo. In this game, it can also come from the reveal, right? It's plugging in your values, your desires, though those tokens, into a machine, a wooden machine, and then revealing what everybody entered. And that reveal is a lot of fun. But if you're looking for a deep strategy game, this ain't it, all right? But it is fun. And you have to decide, based on what I've described, whether it be fun for you. Every game should be someone's favorite game in the whole wide world. Otherwise, this game shouldn't exist. Otherwise, all the other games take care of what this game does, right? But there, there should be some unique quality about this game that makes somebody go, you know what? Okay, look, I understand why somebody might not like this game, but it's perfect for me. I love this about it. I love that about it. No other game does it like this. And Shrilla Stilla has that quality. It is a unique game, and I'm glad I had an opportunity to try it. Thanks for watching. Remember, older games like Shrilla Stilla don't stop being good just because newer games come out. Take care.